this session, uh, it's good to see old friends and new friends, um, as always at Linwood. And this session is called this, Jewish Business Ethics at a Time of Crisis. My assumption is that we can all pretty much agree that this is a time of some crisis. And so it's inevitable that some of the issues that we're going to be talking about may well be about things that are going on right now uh, for you. And that's absolutely fine. And actually using those examples from real business life is something which uh, I think will only enhance the session that we have. So let's get started. My first thing is really to explain to you why I do this at all, why I'm interested in Jewish business ethics. And some of the old friends I can see here have already studied Jewish business ethics with me um, over the past years at Limud or in other places, um, and even in the days when there was JAID, the Jewish Association for Business Ethics. But why me? Um, it's really because of what I used to do in before I became a rabbi. Um, so I'm a rabbi now at Edgware Hendon Reform Synagogue. But a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away in the 1980s, I started a business uh, with a friend at university, which was called Goldsmith's Fine Foods. And our speciality was the distribution of vegetarian and natural snacks and meal products to mass caterers. Uh, so to explain that a little bit, it meant that if you ate a vegetarian meal on British Rail in the 1980s, first of all, I feel slightly sorry for you. And secondly, it probably came from us. And not only that, but actually it was kosher. In fact, it was reasonably strictly kosher at the point it left the factory, because a lot of what we did was helping kosher factories, um, particularly in the North uh, West, to use their excess capacity to produce products, which, of course, were very well monitored in what the ingredients were for universities, for hospitals, for national caterers, etc. And we distributed them around the country. So we were vans and warehouse kind of company, very practical. Um, and in fact, our business's story ended up as sufficiently interesting that we became a case study on the uh, Cranfield University MBA course, which you can see here. And it's really because it's a case study of how not to run a business in the last couple of years of it, um, as it starting with how to run a business for the first few years of it. Um, and uh, anyway, it's really informed a lot of my interest in business and the difficult issues we can often come up against. Today, we're looking particularly at Jewish business ethics in the at a time of crisis. And the first thing I want to do is I'm going to ask Jonathan in a moment to launch a poll. And I'm going to ask you just to answer these questions. So here we go. And at the very end of this session, I'm going to put the questions back up again. And let's see if there's any difference. There may be, there may not be. We'll find out. So here's question number one. Let me just make sure I can get it onto the screen for you. So think, uh, there we go. In dire circumstances, just from where you are now, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? I just want a yes, no, or maybe. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Go for it. Just start with the question number one. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are we finding it possible? Is this working to be able to vote? One person's voted. Okay. <laughs> Just as a general principle, in dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? I'm only going to give you a, about another 10 seconds or so. That's all. all right. You can see it says in progress, but I'm ignoring that. I'll give you question two in a moment. So don't vote on that one yet because you haven't had the question yet. OK, how are we doing on how are we doing on voting? Not a lot of people doing it yet. Is that because it's difficult to do? Let's just check in the chat. Uh, People are having trouble with it. Yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Can't seem to press send unless answer three. Ah, oh, okay, right. So there's a bit of a problem with the way this is set up. Let me explain to you how, I better ask you all four questions, okay? So that way you can do it because it looks like the way it's set up doesn't enable you to do that. So let me go for question number two. So question number one was, in dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Question number two is this. Can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis? So, for example, could you double the price of toilet rolls if you happen to own a shop on a high street somewhere or double the price of pasta? Question number three, and I'll come back to all the questions in a moment, is this. 
let's get it to move on. Is setting up in competition during a challenging time necessarily unethical? For example, you see a business is failing in difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online. You compete against them in this area. So my third one is, can you set up in competition during really difficult circumstances and just make, make the most of it? Um, or is that unethical? And the final question is this one here, which is not the first bit, what's our obligation to help other Jews in tough times, but does any obligation still exist? Is there an obligation to help other Jews at times of financial crisis? So I'm going to go through all of them again so that you can vote again uh, or choose to vote. Thank you. Lots of people are doing it now. Brilliant. First question. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Second question. Can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis, like double the price of toilet rolls or pasta in, a, in your shop? Number three is, can you set up, in, is it ethical to set up competition during a challenging time? Is it unethical rather? Do you see that a business is failing in difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online? You compete against in this area. Is that unethical? And the final one, do we have an obligation to help other Jews in tough times? Does that obligation still exist? Okay. I'm going to now, <laughs> no, I really am going to give it a time limit of 30 more seconds. I think I get the feeling from the numbers of people voting, it's all working okay now. Um, I'll very quickly read the questions down one last time and then let's, let's have up where we are. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions is number one. Number two, can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis, e.g. double the price of toilet rolls and pasta in your shop? Number three, can you set up in, is setting up in competition during a challenging time unethical? E.g. you see a business is failing in the difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online and you compete against them in this area. And finally, do we have an obligation to help other Jews in tough times? Does this obligation still exist? Brilliant. Right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Great. So let me just jot down what we've got. We've got 10 yeses to dire circumstances. We've got 26 no's and we've got five maybes. We've got seven people saying yes, profit. We've got 24 people saying don't profit from the circumstance. And we have 10 people saying maybe. Setting up in competition, we have 24 saying yes, you can set up in competition during a challenging time. That's not in itself unethical. 11 saying no and six saying maybe and then finally can is there an obligation to help and this is the the most clear one it seems which is 34 saying yes there is an obligation to help your fellow during difficult circumstances only one is saying no and six are saying maybe now okay thank you very very much we're going to close that poll now um stop share of results there we go and let's get them out get it out of the way superb Thank you. OK, good. So what we're now going to do is we're going to look at all of those issues and we're going to look at them from the point of view of both Torah texts and also Talmudic texts and also the sponsor. What did this? We are not, of course, the first group of Jews to find ourselves in the middle of a financial crisis of one sort or another. Um, in fact, looking around the screen, my suspicion is that some of you have found yourselves in the middle of financial crises and have had to deal with them several times in your business life or in your personal lives and had to deal with it a number of times. What we're going to do is we're going to discover that, of course, we are not, that not only not the first group of Jews, but also that our tradition has got ways of dealing with it. Then at the end, I'm going to ask the same questions and I'm going to see where do we get the same answers. Let's find out. So here we go. Let's start with the first questions. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Okay. So we have a very basic principle on this that you can find in Torah, in my interpretation of it, which gets interpreted in our text afterwards. First of all, this classic text 
in Deuteronomy chapter 23, all about setting up a good society, deals with where can money come from? In this particular case, the first verse, you shall not bring the hire of a harlot nor the price of a dog into the house of your eternal God for a vow, for these are both abominations to your eternal God, are basically saying it does matter where your money comes from. So um, apologies to anybody here who's in the pimping business. Uh, my assumptions is there probably isn't, or at least nobody's going to put their hands up and say, yes, I am. And it's a totally ethical business. But um, the it would appear that that's not on, at least not for money that could come into a holy place for a holy purpose. The price of a dog, by the way, is interpreted by Rashi as suggesting it's about male prostitution, not about gambling, which is another interpretation of it in other sources. But whatever it is, there's some limit. So that's in holy places. But then immediately the next verse is nothing to do with holy places. It's to do with regular relationships from one person to another. You shall not lend on interest to your brother, interest of money, interest of foodstuff, interest of anything that's lent on interest. To a stranger, you can lend on interest, but to your brother, you shall not lend on interest. Your eternal God may bless you in all that you set your hand to in the land where you are entering to possess. Now, that's essentially saying, don't make money from interest. Don't make money from money itself. It's not saying don't make money from money itself from anybody and everybody. It's saying don't make money from money itself from those to whom you have a link, a direct link, some kind of familial link or peoplehood link. And indeed, that's the normal interpretation of that word to your brother, uh, as it is in the Hebrew. And some of us will know that actually there is a lot of money to be made from lending money on interest to those who are in a desperate situation. Uh, this little chart at the bottom from the Los Angeles Times came from 2018, and it's about the explosion of triple digit APR loans in California, which, as you're probably aware, exactly the same in Britain, exactly the same in South Africa, exactly the same pretty much all over the world. These are loans, uh, often from payday lenders, with interest rates up to four or five hundred percent. And there are some real issues around that, an ethical issue about can you lend money on interest or should you to people who are in a desperate and difficult situation? And we might ask, what is this doing in Torah? It would seem if you look at the context that your brother who needs money lent to them on interest is somebody who is in a desperate situation, probably without seed to plant probably without the ability to make a living in the following year. And that's why they need the money lent on interest. This would suggest there is a limit on where you can earn your money from. Now, whether this particular limit is one that we consider to be appropriate, and I, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of us would say, hang on, how could it be different if you can lend money to non-Jews? How could that possibly be different? Why should it make any difference at all? But the difference seems to be about the links. Um, as uh, Janet said, that's why Muslims have interest-free banks. It is indeed true. However, the big differences between Islam and Judaism on this is if you go by Quranic legislation and after, a Muslim may not borrow money on interest from another Muslim or from anybody Whereas a Jew can borrow money on interest, that's OK, but a fellow Jew by this shouldn't lend it to them. And Jews are allowed to lend money in the Middle Ages because they were lending it to strangers. They weren't lending it amongst each other. They were lending it outside of their community, which seems to be fine here. Underneath it for me is your brother, your needy brother, is probably at a point of crisis, as we will see later on in these texts. And that's why you don't lend the money on interest to him. Now let's carry on. What about when there is shortage? The second question that we looked at was the question of, can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis? And um, we that was interesting, the, the responses that we had Essentially, the majority was no, don't profit by the circumstances of a crisis. There were some who felt yes, there were some who felt maybe. 
in conventional Limud, when we were all in a room, we could go around and kind of ask a few of those people who said maybe, why did you say maybe? What's the question that you're asking? It's very difficult to do it in the way that we're all set up now. But if anybody chucks in the chat, if they were a, um, a person who says um, that uh, they can profit, what could you profit from? If you are somebody who said maybe, what circumstances could you? But let's have a look at the basic situation. Um, I can see Jonathan has mentioned conveyancing transactions where two Jews working together would, who would otherwise be charging each other interest would substitute a legal fiction for that in generally expressed as the profit in the venture in some way. Okay. And that indeed is there, and that's how Israeli banks manage um, in, religious Israel, uh, in the religious community to be able to lend between Jews. In Bava Batra, we, which is the section of the Talmud mostly about land and agriculture, etc., we hear a basic principle. Our rabbis taught concerning those who hoard fruit, who do lend money on interest, um, but ribit, as it is in the Hebrew, Reduce measures and raise prices. Scripture says, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may set forth corn, making the ephah small and the shekel great? Those are two measures. And fortifying the balances of deceit. This is from Amos. And Amos sees a basic corruption as those who say, I will make money now because I'm in a time when I quickly can. If I can get out onto the street the moment Shabbat's over, I'm going to make some money. If, uh, if I, as uh, the illustration shows, if I move the scale slightly to my advantage, I'm going to make money. And that's no good. And the suggestion is that this is what Amos is speaking about when he then says, the Eternal has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I won't forget any of their works. And the idea is supposed to be, you may feel I've got away with it, it's okay, or even that it's been to the advantage of somebody, but yet somehow God knows. That's what Amos says. So this is at the kind of the theoretical place, at the, almost the theological. Um, as Paul says, if you're in business selling products, as long as you're not profiteering, it's ethical to run, run your business as usual. Okay, so that, that, that presumably would be his maybe or his yes, you could make money. I think one of the things that Amos is pointing out is there is going to be fit times when nobody knows that they've been diddled by you. As it says in our Torah, don't even own scales and balances which are not quite correct. Because although you may get away with it, God knows what you're doing. But then the rabbis get practical later on in this piece. And they say this. Right. Suppose you're at the point of a crisis. Um, Anybody remember March? And uh, that is a Lou Roll uh, shelf in Waitrose. Would you believe it? <laughs> Even Waitrose people did a run on the toilet roll. Perhaps I, should, perhaps I shouldn't make a difference there. Oh, and somebody says, there's karma that will come back to you. That's lovely. So the rabbis speak also in Baba Batra about what can you do and what can't you do. So Rab, which takes us basically into third century Babylonia, says you may store your own tub of produce as in don't feel bad that you're helping yourself and your family in a difficult time going out and buying what you need now i'm not going to ask people to put their hands up here but i wonder how many of us did overstock ourselves a bit in march or april when we first thought, OK, I've even got people who are willing to, to put their hand up to it and say, yes, I did it. And it would seem that that idea of looking after yourself a bit, that's OK, it would appear. And also, this has been taught. Fruit and things which are life's necessities, like wines and oils and various kinds of flour, must not be hoarded. Now, anybody remember trying to buy flour in May in Britain? It was impossible. Almost every shop was completely out of it. And of course it was out of it because the second it got in, people would buy it all up and it would all disappear. And nowadays, many shops will now have notices basically saying, please do not do this. And our rabbis recognize 
It's all very well saying you can hoard things, but if people hoard necessities, then we've got a big problem, even if it is for your own family. But spices, cumin and pepper may be hoarded. Now, why would spices, cumin and pepper be OK to hoard, one wonders? I'll just wait for a moment in the chat and just see if someone comes up with why. Why would it be OK to hoard some things, spices, cumin and pepper? Oh, so Michael says just because they're not essential. They're not essential. So there's still a business to be done. But some uh, Christine says but they do help preserve other foodstuffs. So the interpretation as to whether they are essential or not might be rather different. Um, I think from Joan was also probably saying something quite similar. Uh, somebody also, by the way, said the pain you might cause by overcharging something. Also, somebody says, I guess you only use small quantities of these kinds of things, so shortage is unlikely. And Amanda says, because they're actually valuable, they're actually tradable, so keep hold of them at the moment. And one person saying demand is less likely to be affected. You're not going to get a terrible cumin shortage. Um, some of us will know if there's a Delia Smith recipe that's out there that suddenly everybody goes out and buys, buys brown agave syrup and you can't get it anywhere. But that's not a disaster. If flour, wine, basic things go, then you've got a problem. The prohibitions mentions only uh, apply only, say the rabbis, to one buying from the market. Uh, you'll see, by the way, the Hebrew for this I've uh, put in bold. The one for necessities is this. It says, sheyesh bahen chaye nefesh. These are things necessary to basic points of life. And then the person buying from the market is belokach min hashuk, the person who's going out to the shuk to buy. So this is a trader. So some are saying that this hoarding issue or buying greater quantities of flour, whatever it might be, only really deals with uh, things which are market traded. But if it's for the storage of your own things, it is permitted. Um, somebody mentioned pomegranate, pomegranate molasses, which apparently disappeared from the shops after they were mentioned. I don't know if it was a Jamie Oliver or whatever it was, but it was a recipe. Otolenghi. Oh, OK, fine. And you can't find it. But it's not a disaster if those disappear. But once loo rolls started disappearing, I think we all got rather worried. And pasta, etc. And bread flour. That was a real problem and caused some serious strain between people. There were some horrible YouTube videos of people fighting over these things in the shop. However, in years of drought, um, but surot, uh, which is the first word on the last line here, don't even hoard a cab of carobs. Now, carobs, the nice thing about carobs is they're dry, so you can keep them forever. So in theory, they're the best thing to hoard for during famine time or a difficult time. But don't even do that, because why? And this is a very major concern of the rabbis, mikne. Because you bring a curse on market prices, as in you actually create a situation where everybody is suffering. Everybody is suffering and it doesn't work. Now, one person says, what about Joseph? Note what Joseph does before the famine in Egypt. And it's interesting that this is not brought up in these texts at all. Joseph does exactly that hoards everything, buys everything for the Pharaoh's store, buys everything off everybody from horses, which are high value items, down to the very, to the very little bits of land, eventually putting the entire land in the control of the state, in the control of the Pharaoh. And we're going to be experiencing that. We experience that, I think, either in this week's portion or next week's portion. Um, and it's very, very dodgy indeed. Strangely, the rabbis don't bring that in. They make a basic principle that these things you don't do. OK, it does seem, though, you can make some money from shortage. So the spices, cumin, pepper, and obviously those are simply examples. Um, somebody says in Joseph's case, it's seven years before the famine. Everyone could have done likewise. And Joseph is communal purchase, not individual. That's going to come up a little bit later. But point being, you can, it seems, make some money from shortage, but never from basic goods and not from anything at all at a time when everybody is likely to be suffering together. Hence, don't even put a cab of carrots, carobs away 
uh, for later because you're going to make the thing, you're going to end up with an impossible situation in the market. So it does seem that in where shortage is concerned, we must have consideration for others. Okay. Ah, and Jonathan suggests that there'd be no market price because the state owns everything, which is very interesting. For those who, um, I'm, again, looking around the pictures, I bet a lot of you did it. During the times of the Soviet Union, one of the issues that happened is there was no market price for goods, but there were also no goods to buy. So whilst the chicken might cost very, very, very little when there were lots of them, um, there was no market price and there was no chicken to buy it or even water, whatever it might be. So our rabbis usually be very concerned to make sure there's a good market setup going on. Let's look at the next issue. So question number three that we asked was, is setting up in competition during a challenging time unethical? You see a business is failing in the difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online and you compete against them in this area. Can, is it unethical to be in competition? And does it matter what the circumstances are when you are in competition with other people who are also trying to make a living just like you are? Let's have a look. Again, Baba Batra helps us with this because it looks at the issue of what do you do when you're zoning land and zoning a town. Baba Batra also in the Talmud contains a lot about property where things should be, how you should build, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This section is where you should build. Um, by the way, uh, Julie mentioned wartime profiteering and the moral opprobrium it attracted, and of course it did. Has there been coronavirus profiteering? Has that been happening yet? I wonder. And maybe if there's some examples of people who come across, chuck them in the chat. That would be good to know. Competition. Does competition need to be possible? So now again, we deal with some basic principles that our rabbis develop about trying to create a level and decent playing field, a level playing field. Um, I don't want to be too British about this, but since we're at the British Limud, why not? To make sure that it is cricket. Now, nobody could say that's not cricket. A person can open a shop next to another person's shop. By the way, the word for person here is Adam. So it literally means absolutely anybody. I always take that as understanding Adam uh, to mean um, a person, a man or a woman, anybody. OK, somebody says PPE suddenly became available after the shortage. What happened to it? Giving out contracts amongst government cronies. So, yes, perhaps indeed there has been. Can open a shop next to another man's shop or a bathhouse next to another man's bath and the latter cannot object because he can say to him, I do what my, I like in my property, you do what you like in yours. So the basic principle the rabbis seem to be working with is anybody can be in competition. Remember in the previous uh, example, they were very concerned about prices going, pri uh, market prices not being there for goods because of situations of people creating by hoarding. But on this point, there is a difference of opinion among Tanaim, which means the early stage of Jewish uh, text of the second century and before in the land of Israel, as it appears from the following Baraita, meaning it was written in the land of Israel before year 200. The residents of an alley, so basically there's a street, let's call it Golders Green High Street for the time being, can prevent one another from bringing in a tailor or a tanner or a teacher or any other craftsman. So you can't bring in somebody new, but one can prevent another resident of that same area from, but one cannot prevent a resident of that same area from setting up in opposition. There's a sense that all of us have got a chance to make our way in business, but the rabbis of second century Israel are saying, if people from outside are coming in, you can tell them to stop. And Rabbi Simeon ben Gamliel, which shows, tells us how early this was, this is first century, uh, or maybe beginning of second century, says, yes, you can prevent somebody. So once you've already got a tailor in, uh, in Golders Green High Street, it's right. No, no other Jew should open up as a tailor. Once there's already a falafel shop, there shouldn't be another one. Now, by the way, um, I'm just seeing a few things around Pesach prices, around profiteering that can happen in any business, the PPE difference. Um, is different from opening a shop next door in the next street. Okay, right, and all sorts of things, and also the increasing wealth of some people at this point. 
Let's see what our rabbis are going to do with this. Are they going to stick it like, stay like this? Are they going to stay saying effectively, don't open up in competition? And it seems that's the first layer of Judaism says, don't even open, open up in competition, even if you already live in the place and you seem to have a perfect right. And as somebody says, aren't we talking perfect protectionism? Well, our rabbis are concerned about that as well. And this is what they do about it. So I want you to look here at this picture at the bottom, which is a typical shuk, a typical traditional market. Who knows how long this one has been here? And notice everybody's selling the same thing. And that's very typical of a shuk. So if you go to Marrakesh, if you're lucky enough to go there one day, perhaps we'll be able to go back to these places. Um, they have a dyer's shuk where everybody dyes goods. They have a wooden articles maker's shuk. Um, it's even the case in the old city of Jerusalem to an extent. Everybody's selling souvenirs next to each other. And yes, indeed, a specific alley, alley for tailors, etc. Will the rabbis allow people much later in the third century in Babylonia and fourth century to keep this protectionism going? Let's find out. That's in this piece, Rabbi Hunna, the son of Rabbi Joshua, says, it's quite clear to me that the resident of one town cannot present, can, sorry, can prevent the resident of another town from setting up in opposition in his town, but not if he pays taxes to that town. Something changes to say there just has to be a level playing field. And the resident of an alley, alley cannot prevent another resident of the same alley from setting up in opposition. Rab Khuna, the son of Rabbi Joshua, then raised the question, can the resident of one alley prevent the resident of another from competing with him? And it seems to be very difficult to know. You know, can you, if they're in the same town and they're going to really create difficulties, then the issue is going to be very difficult to resolve. And so that word teku is there. Some of you may know that uh, Rabbi Louis Jacobs, of blessed memory, wrote a book on all the tekus left in the Talmud, all the issues that are still not to be resolved. Um, and what were they talking about? What kind of issues are they? And I think in the case of this one, it's really difficult to work out. Why would people be setting up in the same town? Why would you be coming into this town? And there's a lovely and an interesting hint from the 18th century Germany of what they might be talking about. So here we go. This is from the Teshuvah, the response of the Rabbi Mordechai Helberstadt in Dusseldorf in the 18th century. The wine merchants of the city have come before me to complain that the Jews from the outlying villages are bringing liquor into the city and selling it at prices they cannot meet. Why are they coming in? Could be any kind of reason. It could well be that their towns are in trouble it could well be that they're in difficult trading circumstances or Jews are not being allowed to sell these things in the markets in their town. We don't know, but what we do know is they are in a point of crisis. My answer is that the halakha is with the city merchants, as in they can ban these people from coming in. Although we accept the opinion of the sages, that's only in the cases where one can say to the other, I distribute parched corn, you distribute nuts. And that's a, a phrase which basically means you could do the same thing as I do. You could lower your prices on wines as I do. Your choice not to is your choice. But there are situations where that's actually not the case. People don't have that choice. In this case, however, continues Rabbi Halberstadt, they cannot say this. But the dealer, the community, has obtained from his Lord Bishop the monopoly right to sell liquor in the town. So you've got a group of Jews who've had to basically get the permission from the local bishop and buy it to be the people who sell, uh, who sell, the, uh, uh, who sell wine. Um, and I noticed, by the way, that uh, somebody's talking about the situation in the shuk, this clustering, etc., collectively attracting more customers. But in this case, these folks are not saying that that's going to happen. They say that they're having real trouble because of these Jews coming in from outside which was then sold to the wine merchants in return to a tax to finance the communal activities. So another thing to be aware of is where's the money going to, uh, going, coming from that's gone to the Lord Bishop. Some of the money comes back into the Jewish community. So no wonder the rabbis in that space are a little bit concerned uh, if that tax doesn't come in. The villagers not being in the domain of the Lord Bishop are not liable for this communal tax. Therefore, they're able to sell in the town cheaper than the men in the city. Now, 
the men of the city are not able to do what the villagers are able to do. And that's why we don't follow the opinion of the sages. So in this way, in a time of crisis, they fight, there is a reason not to, because it's not a level playing field. However, um, as a couple of people are saying, somebody is saying this is not helping the consumer buy at competitive prices. No, it's th this monopoly is keeping the price of the wine up, but seems to be critical to the life to the livelihood of the Jews who are in that town and that arrangement that they have. Um, an attack on globalization, whereby Western businesses manufacture in China, then import and sell at high prices, banking the profits. Well, there's so many issues around, do you pay the right taxes? Are you, and one of the issues around those who are doing very, very well out of this crisis are those who are not paying the same level of taxes as those who are on the high street. Um, and we are seeing the effects of that. Is that an ethical issue? It would seem to suggest that it is from this to Shuva. But let's just continue with one more thing. Can you always have this sense of preventing other people from making a living in, in your space? Rabbi Joseph said, and this is still in Baba Batra, Rabbi Huna agrees a teacher cannot prevent another teacher from setting up in the same alley because Ezra, so that's taking it back as if it's from Bible times, instituted an ordinance for the Jewish people requiring they establish one teacher alongside another teacher to raise the standard of teaching. The Gemara challenges, let us be concerned lest the teachers will thereby come to be negligent. He said to the objector for the reason mentioned, jealousy of scribes increases wisdom. And we sometimes have that issue in enabling there to be competition. Because if you haven't got the competition, you don't get the quality because you're getting away with goods that are not as good as they might be or services that are not as good as they might be. I think we've got that issue going on in the vaccines, uh, vaccines fit sphere at the moment, which is by competition between the different vaccines, we assume we'll end up with, with something that is as effective as possible. Um, also, by uh, the competition that's been around for PPE has also possibly done that as well. But there are some times when it's right to encourage competition. Now, the example here is teaching Torah, obviously, but I wonder whether that applies to other things. Let's go to the last question that we had, which is, do we have an obligation to help Jews in tough times? Um, and does this obligation still exist? And this was the one that you were almost completely all saying yes. There was one person who said no. There were a few people who said maybe. Um, competition, by the way, it suggests by Julie, may also drive down quality to offer a cheaper price tendering for public services. So competition, I think our rabbis are saying there's times when competition is good, there's times when competition might not be good um, and might not be the right thing to do. Let's go to this last question about can we help other Jews in a crisis or should we help other Jews? And that goes basically straight into Torah. Leviticus chapter 25. We help each other in tough times, it would appear. If your brother has become poor and his means fail with you, then you shall relieve him, though he may be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. Though whoever it is, don't take any interest from him, nor increase, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not give him your money for interest, don't lend him your food for profit. I am the eternal God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and be your God. But yes, indeed, there is an obligation, it seems, to help your brother, to help them out in a difficult situation. Uh, this picture of day laborers, for example, shows one, one way in which we might do. We all know, I suspect, that the highest degree of sadaqah is indeed to help somebody to get themselves into business and maybe indeed to be in competition with others. This obligation seems to be quite strongly there. Um, people say setting up next to each other can end up in a cartel. And also, what about foreign aid? Is this something special from Jew to Jew? I think one of the issues around here is how far can you go to help people? Um, how far can our resources stretch to help each other? I wonder why, whether that's why so many of you voted yes, we do have an obligation to help each other in these times, and so few voted no, but there were still some questions about it and some uncertainties as to whether this should be the case. Let me go to a last uh, issue here. Um, yeah, principle, uh, Michael says, is therefore earn an honest living, but give the excess income away. 
use it to relieve other people. Let's have a look at a real situation, a first century economic crisis and how it was dealt with. So first of all, there's a basic principle in Torah, which is to stop people falling into lifelong debt. And especially because their debt would probably have been for really basic needs, really basic necessities, um, like, uh, like uh, um, just seeds to be able to plant. A stranger and a sojourner are also your brother, Miriam notes. So to say that it's not as restrictive as you might think. So at the end of every seven years, so Deuteronomy 15, you shall grant a release. And this is how you do it. Every creditor who lends anything to his neighbour shall release it. Don't exact it of his neighbour or of his brother because it's called God's release. And if there is among you a poor person of any one of your brethren and inside your gates and your land, which the eternal your God gives you, don't harden your heart. Don't shut your hand from your poor brother. Open your hand wide to him and surely lend him sufficient for his need that he which he lacks. So not just we should help each other. We must help each other. Don't let there be a wicked thought in your heart saying the seventh year, the year of the lease is at hand and your eye be evil against your poor brother and give him nothing. And he cry to the eternal against you and it be a sin to you. So the idea is if you lend money to anybody, you're not going to do it on interest. You're going to help them out, get them their seed, get them back on their feet again. And then when seven years goes by, you're not going to get the money back. And that's fine. And the Torah says, yeah, but you might well begin to say once you get to year six of the cycle, because it was a seven year cycle that everybody was in together, the Shemitah cycle, which we still observe to an extent uh, in, in Jewish communities. But don't don't say in year five of the cycle, I'm not lending because I'm never going to get the money back. Well, what do you think happened? Of course, nobody, nobody would lend once they got to that point. So something happened to sort this out. And I'm sure many of you will be aware of it. There was a solution to the crisis from Hillel the Elder, which means that this is the Hillel who was around in, um, in the turn of the first millennium uh, of the common era, a really early la layer of rabbinic thinking to solve the problem. And he instituted something called prosbol, uh, which you can see in the bold on the first line, which is a Greek word meaning delivery. And so how did it work? A prosbol prevents this remission of debts in the sabbatical year. It's a regulation made by Hillel the Elder, because he saw that people were unwilling to lend money to one another and were disregarding this precept laid down in the Torah. Beware there not be a wicked thought in your heart saying, I'm not going to lend because we come to the end of the cycle. And so he instituted the prosbol, and this is how it works. I hand over to you, the judges in such such a place, my bonds, basically, my ability to collect money off people, so that I can recover any money owing to me from whoever it is at any time. And the prosbol was then signed by the judges or witnesses. What did he do? He made the debts, instead of them being personal debts, debts to the court, and then the court will pay the person back. This is a Jewish legal fiction. But what's going on is saying, we can't get ourselves into a situation where people can be destitute. We've got to get ourselves out of it. And that, I think, also asks ourselves that same question now. What do we do? And what are we going to do in this year ahead to get people out of the great difficulties that they are bound to be in? Are there things we're going to need to change? Or is there a basic ethical standard which must never be changed? Now, what I'm going to do now in the last couple of minutes is we're going to run that poll again. And let's see if anything has changed. It might have, it might not. I've got the original results. Let's see where we get to. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop the share. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan to put the poll up again. I'll read you the questions and get yourselves ready to vote. Are you ready? Number one. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? OK, so the, 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 uh, what I'm going to do uh, for those who are asking the questions, I'm going to just tell you again, I'm going to read the questions down because that way we can make this polling work. But I'm going to read them down again. And then I just want your answers are exactly the same questions we entered with. I want to see if these texts and what we've been listening to and commenting on make any difference at this point. So question one. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Yes, no, maybe. Question two, can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis? That is double the price of the toilet rolls and the pasta. 
Question three, can you set up in competition? Sorry, no, this one I've got to ask exactly correctly, otherwise it doesn't work. Is setting up in competition during a challenging time unethical? E.g. you see a business is failing in a difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online, and you compete against them in this area. And finally, what is our obligation to help Jews in other time as it doesn't obligation still exist? Okay, what somebody's saying is the dire circumstances question is a bit confusing. Yes, so Mike, uh, I'll express it slightly differently. Are there ethical restrictions on making money for a Jew in dire circumstances? <laughs> Let's assume we're in dire circumstances. Are there ethical restrictions on how a Jew makes money? Or do the dire circumstances make a difference, I guess that's what I'm saying. Question two, can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis by doubling the price of your toilet rolls you're selling or pasta? Question three, is setting up in competition during a challenging time unethical? E.g. you see that the, a business is failing in difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online and you compete against them in this area. So I'm going to share screen again for a moment and put these right in front of you so that you can see them as we come to the end of this. Um, we're getting plenty of voting going on. I'll read them one last time um, and then I'll come back to my own contact details for anybody who might want. In dire circumstances, can a Jew make money from anything? Are there ethical restrictions? Or it could be put, are there ethical restrictions on the Jew making money given its dire circumstances? Same thing. Number two, can you profit by the special circumstances of a crisis, e.g. doubling the price of toilet rolls and pasta? Can you do that? Yes, no, maybe. Number three, in setting, is setting up in competition during a challenging time unethical? You see that the business is failing in difficult circumstances by, for example, not selling online. And, not, and you compete against people in that area. Got an obligation still to help Jews in tough times. Okay, right, I'm now going to give you very little time to complete your voting. So can I uh, give you now uh, another 10 seconds to vote? Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. I can see there's little questions, little problems with the way I've tried to express the question. So apologies for that. Well, what's happened? Oh, in diet. Oh, there's there's a lot of change. Very interesting. Okay, you'll have to decide if there's a Jewish text that did that to you or not. Um, I'll tell you what the differences are in one moment. Ooh, a lot of change. Okay, right. First thing, no change to the final one. Okay. The final one, there is no change, and that, that one is the one where we say, um, the final one was, is there an obligation to uh, help other Jews in tough times? Exactly the same, 33 yeses, this time two no's, but basically the vast majority are yes, and no maybes left, one maybe. The setting up in competition is now evens. That's half of us think it's unethical, half of us don't, and those texts about it showed our rabbis too, weren't quite sure. Notice they said teku, we're not really sure what the answer to that is. That's half and half, 15 against 16, 15 yeses, 16 noes. On the can you profit by social circumstances of a crisis, we're basically in the same place. Most of us, 19 to seven of us are saying, no, you can't in the same number of maybes. But another a huge change is this one. In dire circumstances, can, that are there ethical restrictions upon what a Jew can make money? That's gone way up. That's now 19 saying there are ethical restrictions, still 13 saying they're not. But that basically takes us pretty much to the end. Um, I don't know if there are questions possibly in the chat that we should take up with effectively come to the end. Um, and yes, some people may have, uh, have uh, uh, answered not quite as they'd really like to. So I apologize for anything that was a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing. And some are saying, in a very Jewish way. Ah, oh, if you phrase the question differently, then it's easy, then, then you can do it. That's very Talmudic. But I'm not surprised we are. We've been studying Talmud effectively for, for, for an hour. 